it's lockdown number two and so I thought what I do is I come to Avery and show you some of my favourite stones that I've been interacting with for decades now. This is the spine stone. It's a little bit grey here, it's a little bit mystic, but it's got a really big ridge coming down here. So I'm going to show it to you. This is what I call a spine stone. There's one at Stonehenge and what the archaeologists say is it was a mistake at Stonehenge. In the tall in work it wasn't finished off correctly. No, it is a spine stone. And the other wonderful spine stone is a melted top stone circle in Ireland. It's beautiful. What I believe the ancestors were doing, they were using this to heal the chakra system. So for example, if I put my back and my head against this stone, it fits perfectly into my spine. Hence it called the spine stone. It's really strong around the solar plexus and the heart chakra and towards the, the top of my head as well. And it's like these three energy points that are really very powerful and it's very interesting to note that our Druid ancestors didn't necessarily look at the seven chakras, they looked at the three energy points which they called the cauldrons, cauldrons of power, devotion, emotion and spiritual. And I'm just going to show you now how the Dowson rod reacts to these three centers. So we've got one roughly around there and then we've got one here, whoops, and then we've got one around here which kind of equates to the chakra system. Then once you've kind of spent some time relaxing with your spine against the spine stone, just move over into the beautiful gap here. All of the spine stones have this. Beltany tops is even more in. So it's like you can activate here, then relax and let the energy settle uh, around once you're in this gap. So I would recommend in lockdown, if you're feeling down, if you're feeling poorly, well come here. I'm in the outer circle at Avery and now I'm going to show you my other favourite stone in this sector, which some call the evolution stone. So let's have a look at that one. of the stone, there's what's always been described as maybe a monkey face, some say a gorilla face, and we can see its eyes and its nose. So that's always been noted. And if we go on the other side, the outer face of the stone, we see more of a humanoid type of carving almost, if indeed that's what it was representing. But it's on a very powerful axis line. An axis line, you can imagine that you're drawing a line straight across evolution stone here on the kind of monkey gorilla side faces the mid uh, summer sunrise and the human face faces the mid winter sunset so it's on a very important access line i've got lots of favorite stones i'm going to be showing you during lockdown number two but in this sector these are two of my favorite stones I'm standing between marker stones 28A and 28B. In fact, there's a marker stone just in front of me here, which was erected by Alexander Keeler in the 19, late 1930s to represent where a former standing stone once stood. And we're going to walk to a very special area of the West Kennet Stone Avenue. Keeler in the late 30s, alongside Professor Stuart Piggott, said that some of the stones represented male and female forms. And the diamond-shaped stone, he said, represented a female, yin stone, if you will, and the column-like stones would represent masculinity, male stones. And Keeler erected a lot of these marker stones throughout Avebury, and they're all kind of identical. And when we have a look at this stone here, this is what I mean. They're kind of uh, pointed slightly towards the top, but this stone that we're approaching now, this marker stone of Keeler's, is very different. It's the only marker stone at Avebury that has a flat top. Why? Well, in the 30s excavation, 
Keeler and Piggott, they found what they called evidence of an occupation site. And stone 30B marks that. But it wasn't an occupation site. There was no real evidence when it was re-evaluated by Pollard, Josh Pollard and all. So what was going on? There was no stone ever stood here. There was a gap in the avenue, a large gap in the avenue with this stone. So it's the stone that never was, in a way, and many theories abound. Keyless said occupation, but there was arrowhead, sacred uh, objects. There's another theory by uh, Lionel Sims that says it was all about blood sacrifice. Yeah, let's put our prehistoric ancestors as vicious and savage. I do not think that at all. And he goes on to say in his his theory, it represents sacrificial blood that must be spilt at dark moon. That's a conjunction between the sun and the moon when it's hardly visible in the sky. So we have ten holes here and two pits. I think what was going on is this was temple space. This was temple space in the Neolithic period and it was deemed sacred. If we look at the earth energies here, then Hamish Miller was the first to point out that the avenue stones, the width of the avenue stones, mark the flow of the St. Michael Earth Current as it flows from the sanctuary towards Avebury. So here, in geodetic energy terms, that was uh, discovered many years ago, we have what's called a maze. Energy after energy after energy, creating a geodetic power place. And this is where I believe very important ceremonies were used. And we can see there's that hill there, it's called Wading Hill, after Odin, the god, Norse god Odin. And could you imagine seeing the stars, seeing the moon, seeing the sunset because at Avebury this is the first place in a way where the sun actually sets and we'll have a slight look around here at the avenue that goes all the way to Avebury stone circles let's see our ancestors in their true light astronomers geomancers and not making people be murdered in sacrifice for blood for dark moon rituals I think that is so far removed from the truth. Bring back the dignity, bring back their beauty, their grace, their sophistication. This is Avebury and it was theirs. This next place uh, Maria and I went to, I filmed it, it's the elongated long-headed uh, well, princess or high priestess out on uh, Salisbury Hill. Uh, you know where they do all the, on the edge of it where all the army is so, uh, oh yeah, Salisbury Plain. Anyway, this is Maria talking about it. She's obviously done another video. There it is, the Neolo uh, Neolithic long-headed queen, long barrow. Anyway, I hope you enjoy. I'm at the Neolithic High Queen's grave, the long-skulled woman whose whole long barrow here was dedicated to just her. It was a primary burial, very, very rare. But when I came here all of those years ago, probably about six or seven years ago now, there wasn't this fence, there wasn't a no entry sign, and danger, trip hazard, none of that was there. And I'm going to show you what the military have done to this magnificent, magnificent barrow, sorry, which is one of the largest in Northwest Europe. It's nearly 400 feet long. It's massive, it's monstrous proportions, but we're not going to be deterred by a no entry sign. We're gonna go over and we're gonna come over here. Because what the military have done, they've encaged like a Faraday cage. Honestly, it uh, saddens my heart, it really does. The whole of the barrow in this mesh that I'm sure is not going to be positive. It's all over her barrow. Is this the way we should be treating our ancient sites? Is it? I don't think so. Because the West Kenning Longbow has more annual visitors than uh, on this barrow here, and yet it's not encaged or enmeshed with that type of wiring. And we're gonna go down here now because I'm gonna show you how high this barrow actually is. It's about 11 feet high, it's 12 feet. And what we are now is we're walking down 
see the huge long bow in between these two trees. It's, it is ginormous and the Neolithic queen in a flex position, that means put in the fetal position for burial purposes, was set this end here. And I think, intuitively so, that her child was with her as well. But more than that, when we look about why did the ancients place this barrow here? Yes, you could say it's on elevated ground. It overlooks all of the group barrows just about half a mile or so away. But here we have some very uh, powerful uh, female earth currents. And on the top, going right the way, halfway through, then coursing off that way, we have another current making a kind of like cross. So we've got that going down there, a beautiful one going across there, and right where her head was placed, which I think is very metaphysical and very poetic actually, and very artistic, is a geospiral energy pattern so that her head was eternally against earth energy. When Colt Hall and Cunnington came here, they, they took out the bodies, had a look at them, didn't find any gold because this is the new Stone Age, it's Neolithic, nearly 6,000 years old. They put the skull and bones back. Indifference was to follow. Because when Dr. Furnham and others came here, they would just take the bodies out and mass hoard them. Today she resides, her skull at least, and her jawbone in a cardboard box in a facility. And I don't really think that's the way we should be treating our ancestors. Personally, I feel very connected to her. I was uh, joyous when I first discovered her. I really was, because it was a woman finding a woman in the prehistoric times. And like I say, it's so quiet here. You're on the edge of the Salisbury Plain. Sometimes you can visit here. If there's a red flag over there, that means you can't visit. But today, we're lucky. And I'm here to pay homage to this beautiful woman with a long skull. Maybe she had a child here. And in just over in that area there, we see a high prince. He was buried there as well. So this is a royal burial ground. This is the secret history of Stonehenge. And all of this will be revealed in my book coming out soon. And also, I've got some good news for YouTubers. I'm going to be going all around Peru with Brian Forrester next year, next November 2022, uh, to do a, a secret megalith tour and to do a long skulled appraisal tour as well. So thank you, Neolithic Queen, and I'll catch up with you soon.